What I'd like to talk to you about is renaming Cleveland baseball, which I have configured in my imagination as a real-time case study. How did this happen? In midsummer of 2020, in a season when nobody was on the field and nobody was in the stands, a startling announcement came out on July 3rd in Cleveland. The 105 year, whole year name of the Cleveland team, the Indians, would be reconsidered. And in a very oblique, but still apparent message, the meaning became clear. The message was that the team would determine the best path forward with regard to our name, but everyone knew that that meant that it would be changed ultimately. Uh, I'm going to take four points in this uh, team name case history. I wanna give you a little bit about the team name history because we've been known by many, many different names before that 105 year stretch. I wanna do quite a bit of cultural contextualizing then I will do the timeline to date and then just some very short observations. I don't have a lot of observations packed at the end because I'll be doing my summarizing and commenting and observing throughout the presentation. Thanks. Okay, so the team name history. Cleveland baseball began in the 1870s when in 1872, we had an independent team, which then joined the National Association and we were called the Forest Cities. Now Forest City is a Cleveland nickname that shows up on any number of products and signs around Cleveland. I don't know how many trees we have left, but it's part of our Cleveland heritage. Um, as a major team, as a major league team, we have not begun yet until 1901, but we'll continue with what you're seeing here. In 1879, we had our first National League team. It was called the Blues, simply from the color of the uniform. By 1887, and you'll notice there was a gap there, we became part of the American Association as an expansion team. We borrowed names from our own history, calling ourselves the Four Cities, that was the official name, but we were also still named the Blues, apparently from the same uniforms. In 1889, the team moved to the National League. And at that point, for those 11 seasons, we were called the Spiders, partly because of the uniforms, but they say in the lore that it was also the long-limbed appearance of many of our tall and accurate players. For three seasons, the last three seasons, we had an outfielder, Louis Sokalexis, who was from the Penobscot tribe in Maine, and he's credited with being the first Native American to play pro baseball. Hold on to his name because he will show up again later in our history. What happened then? Well, by 1900, we have to step outside Ohio for a minute go over to one of our neighboring states to Michigan. And in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Grand Rapids Rustlers were going to be relocated. They were relocated to Cleveland where they became known as the Lake Shores because we are sited just on the Southern shore of Lake Erie. This was about the same time that Ben Johnson renamed his Western League to the American League, which was then still a minor league. But 1901 was a big year in Cleveland baseball. The American League broke with the national agreement and declared itself a major league. This then made Cleveland one of eight charter members of the American League. We were owned by an industrialist named Charles Summer and a tailor partner of his named Jack Kilfoyle. And we were still called the Bluebirds, often shortened to blues, the team didn't really like being called the Bluebirds. They didn't think that that was an appropriate name for themselves. So they tried to call themselves the Broncos and that has alternate spelling in the history books, but that never really caught on. As the teams moved, what had happened beforehand was this. In the, in the transition from, 1880, uh, from 1899 to 1900 and 1901, in 1889 to 90, the team was decimated by the owners who also bought a St. Louis team. And so they sent Cleveland's best players there because they wanted to build their franchise in St. Louis. In Cleveland, attendance dropped 
to just about an average of 105, I'm sorry, 145 people per game. And this was in our then baseball stadium called League Park that had more than 9,000 seats. The prospects were so grim that they had a hard time getting any teams to Cleveland to even come and play us because they couldn't cover their costs for transportation and hotel rooms because the take from the tickets was so low. By 1889, we achieved the worst single season in Major League history. The record still stands. We had 20 wins and 134 losses. So you can see that we really needed a new spirit and 1901 and then 1902, a new name. What happened in 1902? There was a dispute between the National and the American Leagues and a wonderful player from Philadelphia called Napoleon Knapp LaJoy from the Philadelphia Phillies jumped ship to the Philadelphia Athletics, who then promptly traded him to Cleveland, and he was quite good. He could draw that 900, 9,000 or 10,000 fans for a game. That's his picture over on the far right-hand side. He was very well liked. He was moved to become captain and then by 1905, the manager. And it was under his management that the uh, Cleveland team came close to its pennant, its first pennant in 1908. But after that, it started to decline. And in fact, by 1915, it was, well, by 1914, it was bad enough that as, as you can see there, we got called the napkins because quote unquote, we folded so quickly. In 1915, after that year, we sold Knapp back to Philadelphia to the athletics and Charles Sumner, Summers, the owner, asked local sports writers to come up with a new name. We couldn't be called the Knapps if Knapp was no longer here. The name Indian was chosen and it is disputed as a tribute to Louis Sacalexis. It is probably much more likely that it just became the name. And you can see there that it, early in 1915, the Cleveland Leader, one of the daily papers, was announcing in place of the naps, we'll have the Indians on the warpath all the time and eager for scalps to dangle at their belts. Um, historians of this, uh, Joe Posanowski disputes completely that this would have been a tribute to Louis, Sac Louis Sacalexis remarking that at the turn of the 20th century, Native Americans were not generally held in high esteem. It wouldn't have been an honor. And he says that upon actual reflection, Sacalexis was probably more of a minor and something of a troubled outfielder who played only 96 games in three seasons with us and had only about 100, a little more than 100 at-bats in his entire career. Instead, they, he also notes that instead of an honor, that Sacalexis himself was subjected to whoops and mocks from the crowd when he came onto the field. <laughs> in, 19, in, in 1916, the scores and the revenue were down so far and Summer's own business practices were down and he sold the team to a syndicate under a Chicago Railroad star, Jack Dunn. And from then on, the Cleveland team of history just continues, but the name continues. So notice that this was in 1915, and it is not until 105 years later in July of 2020, on July 3rd, when we have a Twitter, when we have on Twitter, I'm sorry, from the Cleveland Indians, we embrace our responsibility to advance social justice and equality with that in mind, we are committed to engaging our community and appropriate stakeholders to determine the best path forward with regard to our name. And this is obviously a screenshot of that. You'll notice the language in it about the responsibility to advance social justice and equality. And it is particularly tied, and this is the cultural context, to quote, the recent social unrest in our community and our country. But before I address the cultural moment of 2020, I want to recognize an important parallel history with the names of the Cleveland Legro teams. This is a robust list from 1922 all the way to 1950. Uh, it's compiled in part by historian Stephanie Lisko and, of course, the uh, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Lisko notes the transitional continuity of sequence of teams 
with some gaps, but always coming back to the field. And if you read this, you'll notice that there's not a single ethnic name on the list. The longest lived team, uh, team name is the Buckeyes, named after the state tree, um, and of course of Ohio State fame. The Negro National League disbanded in 1948. This was part of the Negro American League, which held on till 1950. Both of them ultimately closed under financial difficulties. This would have been post-World War II when the uh, regular leagues started signing black pay, uh, players. The first, of course, was Jackie Robinson in the National League. And in 1947, uh, Cleveland owner Bill Veek signed Larry Doby, who was the first African-American in the American League. He was a center fielder. And Cleveland also boasts 1975 signing of Frank Robinson, who was the first black manager in the major leagues. So probably many of you also caught the news last month in December of 2020 when MLB noted, announced that the, that the Negro Leagues would be accorded major league status and the stats of all black baseball players will become part of official record. It is still not a widely diverse sport. And at opening day last year, only 7.8% of major league baseball players were black. Which brings me then to the cultural context and particularly the cultural context of 2020. It was a season of soul searching with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis on May 25th. But that's just one, one example of many of a long history, long, long and shameful history, leading to more involvement of the Black Lives Matter movement and getting the attention of brands. So I'd like to take a detour now to a couple of commercial products. It's part of the cultural context and I have a few parallels here. The first example is Aunt Jemima. This is a brand that began in 1889. It's a brand of pancake flour. What you ask is pancake flour. It's finely ground and it usually includes some baking powder for rising as a leavening element and some salt. This was a trademark and it was trademark, trademarked by 1890 based on a minstrel song, Old, Old Aunt Jemima, it was about her wedding after it was sold to the Davis Milling Company. Um, the milling company, Davis Milling, started hiring women to act as uh, representatives of its product at fairs and parades. The key representative was modeled after Nancy Green, who had been born in 1834 as a slave in Kentucky. It remained in the Miller, milling company until 1925 when it was sold to Quaker Oats and Quaker Oats is now a subsidiary of Pepsi. So what happened? In June of 2020, we have a statement from the chief marketing officer of Quaker Foods saying that we recognize Aunt Jemima's origins are based on a racial stereotype and a need to change. And with that, PepsiCo is announcing that it will donate $5 million to create meaningful ongoing support and engagement in the black community. Uh, this sets up a, a template, unwittingly probably, but it would be followed by others, where a name change was tied directly to the moment of 2020, the unrest in the US based on the latest eruptions of racism and police brutality. And it is connected then to a deliberate change of a brand name and to a commitment to re-engagement in the community. And at the bottom, I, there was a wonderful article by Michelle Norris. It was a reflection that she offered in the Washington Post. It was carried here in Cleveland by uh, the Cleveland paper, The Plain Dealer, reflecting on the role her grandmother had played as an Aunt Jemima interpreter. Second example is Uncle Ben. This is a 70-year-old brand. The image had been used since 1943. Uh, Mars, who now owns the brand, reports that the image was based on a Mater D in Chicago, a black Mater D named Frank Brown. You'll notice he's wearing a white shirt, a black bow tie, and there's his picture. They did the same kind of public announcement. It was a renaming announcement. Uncle Ben's will now be called something else. 
And in fact, they ultimately announced that they were changing it to Ben's original. They rebranded it with no picture. And I also uh, have discovered in, in researching this that uh, Mars has trademarked that color orange as its trademark. Notice that there is an explicit connection to social justice. The heading of this category on its website says this. Here's its heading. We've listened. We've learned. We're changing. So it's explicitly tied to the social justice movement and with a commitment to the community. I now have a counterexample. This is Land of Lakes. Uh, for years, Land of Lakes used an image of a, a Native American woman, later called Mia. She was known as the Butter Maiden. Uh, Land of Lakes was fo founded in 1921 by a co-op, a group of Minnesota dairy farmers. And the Butter Lady, Butter Maiden, appeared in 1928, designed by an illustrator named Arthur Han Hansen. Modified in 39 and again in the late 50s, the subject of many middle school visual jokes. Uh, it has long been decried the North Dakota State Representative Ruth Buffalo, herself a Native American, has noted that it was not just racist, but also misogynistic. And on the day when they announced that it would change, the Minnesota Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan, who's a citizen of the Ojibwe's, tweeted, thank you to our Land of Lakes for making this important and needed change. Native American people are not net mascots or logos. What is surprising, and market analysts have noted this, is that Land of Lakes, even after Mr. Floyd's death, because their decision had been made and announced in February, but even after Mr. Floyd's death and the heightened sensitivity that it precipitated, Land of Lakes has never explicitly described its change in terms connecting it to racist themes. Okay. Higher education has a brand, Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. Ole Miss is actually the name that enslaved people usually called the wife of the heir and the owner part of the hierarchy of plantation life and degradation. The site of, of the university attributes this name to the late 1800s and a student named Elma Vick, who, Meek, I'm sorry, who suggested it as a name for the yearbook. Of course, it is tied to the post-Civil War narrative of slavery that tried to romanticize the slave past. In 1930s, Old Miss was reported by the student newspaper to be based, and, and they based their story on an interview with Meek, who said that it, quote, connoted the admiration and reverence accorded the womanhood of the Old South. Historians of it say that it is, quote, a southerner of the 1890s version of Alma Mater, or the nourishing mother. And they acknowledge that it may have been an imagined term of endearment, but it is a positive image only if you bought into that kind of fantasy. In 2014, because over the last decade, there has been quite a move to change it, uh, the chancellor announced after having done a study that, quote, the vast majority of alumni and students embrace it and they have no intention of changing. What they have done is try to associate the name Old Miss with their sports teams and con continue calling themselves the University of Mississippi for Academia. Uh, it still carries, they, they claim, strong positive national and international recognition. And in his statement, or in the statement in 2019, when the Chronicle was researching this, an official statement sent to the Chronicle said, quote, Ole Miss is and will continue to be the nickname used by the university. Now hold on to this example, particularly with the thought that they believe that there is no need to change. Next, we're getting a little closer to the sports, the sports brand, the Washington Redskins. As you know, this was another one of the teams that had been pushed rightly to consider a name change. And what we have here then is the change to the Redskins. Notice that if you start in the July language here, on July 1st, investors 
representing billions of dollars, sent letters to Nike, Pepsi, and FedEx calling them to end the team sponsorship. And things accelerated after that. FedEx asked for the change, the name to be changed. Nike removed its gear from its website. And that was when the team said it would review the name. From now on, or at least through this season, it is known just as the Washington football team and new logos and uniform have been unveiled. You saw the logo before. In sports brand, Cleveland has long had Chief Wahoo. It appeared for the first time as the little Indian in the Plain Dealer, that one of the daily papers, became standard in game coverage. It was designed as an official logo in 1947. It got named Chief Wahoo later. It was redesigned, stylized, and changed, and only minor changes through 2018. The last game on which the image appeared on the uniforms was on October 8th, a loss to the Houston Astros. Timeline to date. The announcement uh, started in July. There was a period of radio silence, and then in December of 2020, owner Paul Dolan said, we've decided to move forward with changing the current team name and determining a new non-Native American base name for the franchise. The themes of his letter invoked the history, community involvement, and the sense of unity. Preliminary decisions. Uniforms of the Indians' name will remain through this season, 2020 and 2021. No placeholder name like the Washington football team. And when I try to back door to get in to find some of the more information that I wish I could provide, I got this statement, very polite, very professional, from Curtis Danberg, the Senior Director of Communication. They're playing it very close to the best. Many, many positive reactions from the fans and media of the, of the nature of, finally, it took too long to wait. Negative reaction invoked the sense that there is no need to change. There's so much glory and nostalgia in 105 years of history. And also, remember I mentioned this, the insistence that the name is not offensive. Attributed to the Psycho Lexus as an honor. And then a couple of, I think, more thoughtful responses that invoked the model of the Atlanta Braves, who consulted tribal leaders and decided to keep the name. And you'll see down below the lost opportunities to teach Native American history and culture, which is kind of the model of the Florida State Seminoles. Okay. Name Watch has been fun. We got an instant tweet from President Trump. The media have been overwhelmed. Additional staff mailboxes and laptops have been unable to hand the handle the volume. And one of my favorite parts of this is the discovery that trademark squatters have filed at least 20 names at the patent office because they think that if they pick the right name that the franchise wants, the owners will then pay them to surrender the rights to the name. And we've had hundreds of suggestions. I'll be quiet for a minute. You could just look at some of them here. And so, the project is, has been described simply as massive. Terry Pluto is a long-running uh, columnist, first in the Akron Beacon Journal and then the Cleveland Plain Dealer, says that it is massive. The Indians will not hurry it. They want it to work. But as you can see on the left of the screen, there are so many different things to consider. And as I said, I, most of my observations I've threaded throughout, but here would be four. We know this. Um, that, that renaming, naming and renaming, both of those would be a cultural act. Summer of 2020 absolutely became a tipping point with the racially charged events that prompted changes in brands that had long been considered offensive, but people were hanging on to them. And that resistance to name changes invokes history or nostalgia. You know, we've had it for 105 years or simply denies that the name is offensive. I think that because baseball occupies such a central role in U.S. culture within sports, which are themselves central to U.S. culture, I believe that that heightens the import of naming and a reminder to us that the process of renaming is as important as the name itself. And then what follows, it would be impossible to give you a complete biography, bibliography Every, this is, as I said, it has exploded in the media. There's just much, much, much available. 
I will say that it ended up being um, a fascinating thing to research. And even though my proposal uh, uh, suggested that I would do this in real time from the time of the uh, the proposal, the proposals were due at the beginning of August and the announcement came to us on July 3rd, perfect timing, um, but I will continue. The, uh, there's a question about uh, whether the majority of the response was positive. Uh, I would say that there are diehard fans who are never going to be happy that 105 years of history is being let go. But the realization has dawned on people across, across Cleveland that this is an important and necessary change. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been fun sharing this with you this afternoon.